Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are going to go ahead and get started here in a minute. We're just letting people into the system. You're about ready to go. What do you think, Dr. Kenodi and Kayla? Yes, let's fire away. All right. Well, hello, hello again, everyone. My name is Lauren. I'm a functional dietitian nutritionist, and I'm going to be your host for today. We are really excited to talk about brain health and biohacking your way to better mental health, especially because this is National Mental Health Awareness Month. In this discussion today, our presenters are Dr. Anoop Kanodia, a functional medicine physician, and Kayla Barnes, a certified brain health coach and biohacker. They will be giving you their own unique perspective on the mind body connection to mental health, sharing information on cutting edge treatments, and providing tips on how to um, biohack your brain, which I'm sure we're all very interested in. And then towards the end, I'll be discussing some nutrition tips to nourish your mind and body. And we want to make sure that you stay until the end because we do have a, a really awesome Q&A um, where we will answer some of the top questions that were actually submitted by all of you. So let's go ahead and dive in. And we're going to start with Dr. Kenodia. So our discussion today, you know, like I said, such an interesting topic. We're talking brain health, biohacking, mental health. And I'd like to know, Dr. Kenodia, just why you feel it's so important to open up this conversation. You know, um, I think we, many of us have experienced either sadness or stress and, or even pain or fatigue, just sub quality life and it stinks. And, you know, I think that that's one thing. I think second thing is a lot of the medications and current therapies aren't working. And there's a lot of stuff that's out there uh, that makes people feel good. And life is so short, you know, we should feel good and enjoy the life that we have. And I want to bring people uh, along with Kayla and you, hey, what are the best things we can do so we can have a happy life and enjoy the time we have on earth? Yeah, that's, I mean, how incredible. That's very powerful. And, you know, this is from a functional medicine perspective. And, you know, you've provided such valuable information over the years to the community um, and within these webinars. What really inspired you to go more towards the functional medicine world? You know, I think that um, in medical school, I learned that less than 10% of illnesses are curable with conventional medicine. That's number one. And, uh, and I did not want a 90% failure rate as a doctor. I'm like, if that's the case, and I'm just going to leave the profession and do something else. Mm -hmm. But my hunch was there was, there was something out there. There was solutions that I'm not learning in medical school or residency, right? I mean, I went to Mayo Clinic for my residency, so it's a great institution, but I still wasn't learning the answers. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until searching and searching and searching that did my boss say, hey, have you met Mark Hyman yet? I'm like, no, actually. He's like, well, I think that might be up your alley mm -hmm. and you're always searching. And then when I learned functional medicine, the docs were happy. The patients are getting better. I'm like, this is what a real doctor is. I'm, I want to learn this and do this for my life. So, but yeah, I, I just, I think the whole purpose of healthcare practitioners whether we're a coach, dietitian, or a doctor, people are coming in there with symptoms. They want to feel better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to have tools to help them feel better, not just say, oh, if you're 40 and that's how you should feel at age 40. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense to me. And we're going to talk about some great tools today. So that's really exciting. Uh, Kayla, we're so excited that you were able to today. Yay. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sure so many people are wondering when I mentioned that you're a brain health coach, what the heck does that mean? Can you please tell us more? Sure. Yeah. So what I do with clients is I do work with clients to take, take their brain health basically from good to great. So I work with a lot of high achievers, but why I get interested in brain health is because 
brain, your brain is involved in everything you do. Science facts that if you have a healthier brain, you'll be happier, you'll be more successful, and your quality of life is just going to go up overall from the quality of our relationships to financial, you know, futures, things of that nature. Our brain is involved in all of these pieces. So I knew that if I wanted to have my, you know, best life, achieve optimal health, vibrant health, I would really have to work on my brain first. And that's when I found um, a quite renowned brain doctor, Dr. Daniel Amen, trained under him. And it was an incredible experience. I can pair that with nutrition as well. And um, yeah, so that's what a brain coach does is helps people in different stages of life to improve their brain health. And when I talk about brain health, I think of it in kind of separate but united um, ways. So we have the physical physical structure and the health of the brain. So how is the blood flow to the brain? Are you eating the right nutrients? Are you doing the right things to increase blood flow, neurotransmitter production, things of that nature? And then we have mindset. So how do we think about ourselves, about our health, all of these items, because they are definitely connected and the health of our brain influences our mindset. So I'm really excited to dive into all of that. And of course, biohacking today. Um, so yes, thank you again for having me. Yeah, of course. No, that's awesome. That's really cool. Um, really awesome to hear you speak. And I, again, I know we're all really excited. I want that, you know, I want optimal brain health. I can imagine everybody on this webinar wants that as well. So let's dive in, you know, let's talk more about this and, you know, Dr. Kenodi, I'm going to hand it over to you. And if you don't mind just telling us a little bit more about that mind body connection in relationship to our mental health. Absolutely. And, um, and uh, yeah, thank you guys for both being there. And uh, I just want to give a, a shout out to Kayla. She just got off the plane and she's been on this webinar. So I want to say thank you for that. And that if there's any background noise, uh, that's the airport's fault, not Kayla's. Okay. Yes, my <laughs> I tried to find the best background I could. I'm working with what I have. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a brain healthy background. I can see it already. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the things is What's the mind-body connection, right? I just want to get some of the background stuff. So and it's kind of interesting. You know, when I say mind, what are we saying? Mind's, mind's not our brain. It's our thoughts, our feelings, our beliefs, our attitudes. And the, and, the, and the mind actually can affect our biology, you know? And so the physical body is something different, um, which all makes, okay, it makes common sense. But when we say mind, I'm not talking about the brain. It's, the, it's that other part. And so when we say a mind-body connection, we are saying is how does the mind, our thoughts, our feeling, affects our body and how our body affects our mind and, and our brain, right? And so what's interesting is there's actually a common language between our mind, our thoughts, and our body. And those neuro, there's, that's the chemistry of the body, the neurotransmitters and these other things. And so what's cool is that our thoughts can actually turn into things that help heal the body or our thoughts can turn into things that harm the body. Same thing, physical things can turn into signals that can hurt the mind. And so what we're, what we're realizing is that they're both connected that are how our thoughts affect how we how our body is pain fatigue and our body affects our mind and what's interesting is that up to 300 years ago we had it right we uh, had it where you treat the whole person and there is no mind body connection it was just that you're just one person about 300 years ago they said it's two separate things that the doctors take care of the body, the church takes care of the mind. And since that time, it's been, a, it's been an ever uphill battle. But recently, they showed that the mind affects the body, the body affects the mind. Very interesting. Yeah, definitely. And, and so what are some of the ways that, you know, this can essentially manifest, you know, that connection between the two, right? So how, how does one impact the other? What can we do then, you know, in a more practical sense for a day to day in order to support, you know, one which supports the other? Right. And that's a really good question. And I think that 
what we find is we just talk about the mind and about stress that we all have in a, in a, you know, many of us have in this country that the stress and those things increase risk of cancer. But what's interesting is also people with the highest stress live 10 years shorter lifespans. Hmm. The people that are the happier, they actually live longer lifespans. That's really cool. And, and I'm interested in hearing some of, of Kayla's biohacks to help with the mind part of this, to help the body out. Um, but um, so that's so that's interesting to me. Mm-hmm. And when we say, you know, how does the mental health affect the body? What we find is over and over again, our thoughts can cause illness. And whether it's chronic diseases, it could be diabetes, asthma, heart disease, cancer. Top three illnesses all relate, can be related to our mind. It can affect our sleep. You know, it can affect how people do habits like smoking and tobacco, smoking tobacco and alcohol. And those all shorten lifespan too. So what we're finding is that our thoughts can actually lead to illness and lead to a shorter lifespan. And that's, it's, it's so crazy to, for me to think that, that I would not think about how I think affects if I get diabetes or not, if I get cancer or not. But the research shows that. Wow, that's a big statement. <laughs> That's a lot for people to to digest there in a sense. And, you know, I know you were really excited when you came back from your trip to Idaho and bringing a really cool new treatment into the office, um, you know, an opportunity. Is that something that you would like to share with everybody? Absolutely. Um, what we're finding is, from our perspective, there's probably three ways to figure out why someone has illness. One way is talking. And what I love about the health coaches, dietitians, um, is that we've got more time to talk to the patient, not not the five minute thing. You know, know, functional medicine, we spend an hour with a new patient, half hour to an hour with follow-ups. And Lauren, you've got long visits, et cetera. The second way is lab testing, the more advanced, that's the chemical ways. And the third way now is we're now doing a brand new functional medicine physical exam to see what the body is actually telling us. The body can also give us a great sense of what is causing some of the mind issues, whether it's the emotional part and what some of the body issues are and how they're linked. And when we find the blockages in the body, what we are doing is we're injecting ozone underneath the skin, just like a TV shot. And our results are off the chart. we're calling this the brain body reset. The average person is seeing a 20% improvement that day. And um, I've been doing it about twice a week for about a month. And I would say I feel about 10 years younger. I just feel better because I, I want to hear the body, what the body is telling us. And the body says, hey, I need more support in my adrenals. I need more support in my th- thyroid. We then just do that sub Q with ozone, which helps heal those parts of the body and, and also connects the brain back to the body. So just really grateful is another tool in the toolbox to help people feel better, you know, that listening to what the body's telling us. Did you say it makes us look 10 years younger or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish both. <laughs> They, but my, my, my gray hair is not turning black yet, but, uh, <laughs> but that's the goal. Okay. That is the goal. Well, I can't wait to try it. <laughs> <laughs> that's on my list. <laughs> awesome. No, that's, that's really great. I know we've had some staff who have just been, you know, loving the experience, um, you know, learning about it and really feeling like this is the next big thing that we can do for our patients and for the community. So that's, that's really wonderful. Dr. Kenodia, is there anything else that you would like to add on the end of mental health before we dive into talking with Kayla about the physical brain health? Nope. I've talked enough. (laughs) I want to hear from you too. 
All right, Kayla, you're up. Let's learn about brain health. I know you were talking about the physical brain and you were connecting that. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us more. Yes, absolutely. There's an announcement. So I'm so sorry. I was trying to mute. But, as long as you don't um, need to mute wherever that is. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, it's okay. Um, so I think when we think about brain health, first of all, we have to cover the basics. We would be remiss not to speak about the basics. So what is the brain health basics? You mentioned sleep. Sleep is the most one of the most foundational pieces of brain health because when we sleep, our glymphatic system is activated, and that's basically the brain's cellular waste clearance system. So not only getting enough sleep, but also getting high quality sleep is incredibly important. So they say between seven to nine hours, but we want to also make sure we're getting enough deep and REM sleep. I use the Aura Ring and you can use a tracker if you want. You can also just pay attention to how you feel. If you're waking up feeling refreshed after a night's sleep, that's a good indicator that you slept well. But sleep is so foundational. Memories are stored then. So that's definitely one of my top tips for better brain, physical brain health. The other one is diet. So mm -hmm. our brains are mostly made up of fat and water. And they're mostly made up of fat and water. So we want to definitely nourish our brain with healthy fats and lots of water. Healthy fats like avocados, olive oil, nuts are really good. I love walnuts. Can you guys hear me or no? A little bit. You know. Uh, yeah. Um, I was hoping this would go a little bit better. No, I say, you know, so I really appreciate everyone on the on the webinar with us going with the flow you know. yes me too there we go so okay please. so yes back to diet so we had sleep i think you guys heard of all of the pieces out on that so now we have diet so what does a brain healthy diet look like because if you think about it our brain only weighs about two pounds two to three pounds but it uses about 20 to 30 percent of our daily calories so it's a very energy consumptive organ so everything that you're putting into your mouth, that's turning into basically cells for your brain throughout your whole body. Dr. Mark Hyman says it really well. He says, do you want to be made up of Doritos or do you want to be made up of grass-fed steak and blueberries? I mean, you literally are what you eat. Our parents said that, but it's so true. It's not just calories, it's information for our cells. And when we're talking about our brain, it's what our brain is going to run off. So if we want higher quality energy, if we want to have a better mood, Foods are all directly linked to that. So we have the healthy fats, avocado, olive oil. I always recommend choosing organic if you can. Um, then there's also the clean 15 and the dirty dozen. If your resources are a little bit um, more restricted, you can look at that and then choose the dirty dozen to always choose organic. We also have wild uh, caught fish and salmon. We really want that EPA and DHA from those wild caught fatty fish. So those are really good to incorporate into your diet as well. Dark leafy greens are loaded with incredible uh, polyphenols, antioxidants. So those are a big part of a brain healthy diet as well. I also love to do sardines. Um, I mix it in with like a little bit of avocado mayo and make it almost like um, how you'd make like a tuna salad, but there's a little recipe tip. Um, I add a little bit of diced red onion in there, the sardines, the avocado mayo, and I just put it on a bed of greens. That's a really brain boosting, brain healthy recipe that takes less than like five minutes. So really easy. Um, we also, of course, like I said, we want to have a lot of water to keep the brain hydrated because we definitely don't want to get dehydrated. Um, that will definitely lead to potentially more brain fog. And then exercise is the next big one. So, and in no way am I saying to go off medications, you should always consult with your doctor and have a practitioner walk you along this. But what's really interesting is that um, exercise in Zoloft have actually been compared in studies in clinical trials. And exercise has beaten Zoloft in the long run. So if you are able to incorporate an exercise practice into your life, it boosts dopamine, which is our motivation molecule, it boosts serotonin, it boosts brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is basically like miracle growth for the brain. For a long time, they thought that we couldn't generate new neurons and that neuroplasticity was limited, especially in adults. We've always known neuroplasticity and brains are growing in children, but we now know that we can either make a better brain or a worse brain. So our brain looks different today than it did yesterday. And it's going to look different tomorrow than it does today. And that's based on our inputs. So if we allow ourselves to watch, you know, fear-based media and negative news and, and all these negative, um, you know, kind of situations and inputs, that's how our brain is going to wire. So it's going to wire for negativity. The neurons that fire for negativity are going to get stronger while the positivity neurons are actually going to get weaker. So every action that I take 
I'm always thinking, is this going to make my brain better or worse tomorrow? Because we have control over that. So that's another big piece. We have diet, we have uh, hydration, we have sleep, we have exercise, and exercise boosts blood flow to the brain too. So we always want to focus on our blood flow. I saw on your slide, Dr. Kenodia, that you had alcohol. Alcohol significantly decreases blood flow to the brain. So we want to do less of things that decrease blood flow, more of things that increase blood flow like exercise, because when we have better blood flow, we have better um, oxygenation to the blood and better nutrient delivery. So always doing things of that nature. So those are really the, the baseline basics. Um, walking, getting like 10 to 15,000 steps a day, that low level movement has also been shown in studies to be a brain booster. Um, vitamin D in the eyes. And you could also label these biohacks. I think that these are like the original biohacks. These are like our ancestral biohacks things that were so natural and native, but we've really gotten away from, but like sunlight in the morning, not only is it going to help you set, you know, your circadian rhythm, which is essentially our clock, our sleep wake cycle clock. And that influences when you get tired, how well you sleep, but food can influence that as well. So what time of day we eat, but getting sunlight into the morning, the vitamin D is amazing. And it's also going to give you a natural energy boost. Um, so those are the brain health basics. I'll go into a couple of my other favorite biohacks, but um, I think that there's some really executable and actionable items that you guys can take from that. And then I can't wait to talk about what everything that we do at my clinic live that's going to be opening in Columbus soon. And that's more of like the biohacking side of really taking it to the next level. Wow. <laughs> So many great tips, Kayla. Thank you. And I mean, I'm ready to hear more about this clinic that you just teased us on. Mm -hmm. Ready to tell us more about it? <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, okay. Liv on my shirt here. Um, so we have a, an office right now in Cleveland and it was our first one. It's amazing for me because it's mixing everything that I'm passionate about under one roof. So we do offer um, functional medicine-esque services there as well. And we love Dr. Kenodia and we can't wait to work with him in Columbus. But we look at the patient as a whole. So what do your blood biomarkers look like? We can do biological age testing, pre-screenings for a lot of potential, um, you know, genetic issues down the line or diseases. And then we put together a plan of care. So whether that be supplements or exercise, movement, but then we have a lot of really cool devices that are involved in, in the location. So we have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which is my favorite brain boosting um, therapy, you could say. So if you were to receive a concussion or a TBI, hyperbaric is an incredible brain healer. So the oxygen that we're breathing every day is at about 20%. Um, this is going to take pure oxygen mixed with pressure. So it's going to drive the oxygen into the cells. It significantly increases blood flow to the brain, which can heal um, you know, concussions, TBIs, but it can also help do things like preserve the brain. They're actually doing hyperbaric and trials to, and they're saying it's one of the First therapies, non-medications, non-pharmaceutical interventions that can start to slow and maybe even potentially reverse Alzheimer's because the, the brain is getting so much significant blood flow. We have a hyperbaric chamber. We have red light therapy. And I'll go through these pretty quick. But um, everyone knows red light therapy for the skin benefits, for the topical benefits, um, potentially um, increasing elastin and reducing wrinkles, fine lines. But we love it for the deeper penetration and it, the effects that it has in our, our mitochondria. Our mitochondria um, are the energy centers or the powerhouses of our cell. And I'm sure we can dive into that too because our brain, of course, also has mitochondria. Um, but the red light helps to energize the mitochondria over time. It can also sometimes be used for um, seasonal depression, things of that nature. Because, you know, sunlight, everyone feels great when they go out in the sun. And it boosts your mood. You know, the vitamin D is amazing, but it's also a natural mood booster. So we have red light, we have pulse electromagnetic field, which is really good for athletic recovery. So it helps to, um, a lot of athletes use it to um, repair muscles faster. It's also great for um, circulation in the body. We also have um, cryotherapy or cold therapy. And cold therapy is something that you can do at home. I recommend everyone try cold showers. So in studies, and this is cold immersion therapy, you're actually like fully in a tub. So we're not going to say that a cold shower or is going to give you the same effect, but it boosts dopamine by 250%. So I do a cold shower every morning. 
So again, well, let's just say 100 or maybe less percent because we're not going to be in a cold tank. But the cold shower is amazing for boosting dopamine and also boosting adrenaline. So it's going to give you that natural energy rush. So cryotherapy, like we have at our facility, is going to do the same thing. Um, we also have, we do some ozone therapy there as well. So we have an ozone sauna, which a lot of patients with mold or autoimmune or Lyme find really helpful. It can help you detox. It also has benefits for the skin. It has PEMF inside. It's really the ultimate biohacking place. So everything that I love to do and things that I've been studying for years, we put under one roof. We do IVs there. And we do beauty services. We want people to look good, feel their best, all of it under one roof. So PRP facials. Xenamin, which is like a nat more natural version of Botox if you choose to go that route. But those are pretty much the services that we offer there. It's called Live, and we're going to be opening in Upper Arlington. That sounds awesome. And those are all um, different types of biohacks that you have done yourself then, it sounds like. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I actually like have meetings in the hyperbaric chamber. So I get the benefit from my brain. The person in the meeting gets the benefit. So, yeah, I love all of the, the biohacks that we offer there. That's awesome. And so Lauren, one thing that I, I want the the audience to uh, take this in mm -hmm. that whether you have physical symptoms or you have mental stuff, stress, anxiety, depression, the number one thing I want people to know is that there are solutions that your primary care or your traditional doctors are not telling you about. They're doing their best. So Kayla mentioned about 150 and, and <laughs> in a great way. And what I'm, what, and I'm saying that, in a, and I mean that awesomely because there's 150 ways that you can improve, right? And that's the take home that maybe you're not going to find the answer on this webinar today, but I want you to say that there's a reason for your depression or anxiety or stress or your, your body symptoms. And if you haven't gotten there, there's resources for you. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing, right? Many people who are depressed, there's hopelessness. Or anxiety or stress, it's just a vicious loop. Um, so that's really cool, Kayla, what you're saying, that you're going to bring more resources to Columbus. Yeah. And these are already tested resources in Cleveland. And... Um, and I know I've done many of them myself. And so, um, so, but that's just really, really cool to know that you don't have to suffer. Agreed. And I know what I said, so I, I went through it quite fast and it can seem overwhelming, but the key here is to just start small. Like we're talking little baby steps here. So if I were you, um, and I have a lot of resources on my Instagram, I post like the brain healthy diet. So it's just my name at Kayla Barnes, but it's kind of the playbook there. So that's, that's the only reason why I'm, I'm suggesting you check it out, but just start small. So maybe, you know, the first morning you go out and you get five to 10 minutes of vitamin D in the morning. Maybe you purchase a water bottle with, with the, the marks on it. So you know how much water you're consuming every day, or you set a timer, um, Maybe on the third day, you incorporate one cold shower. You can start hot and then go cold at the end for 30 seconds. And I promise you, it'll be a little bit painful at first, but you're going to enjoy it after. So it's all about just making a game plan and then incorporating these into your life in small, reasonable steps. Because we all know if you try to do all of them, first of all, it can be time consuming. Second of all, you might not stick with it. So just do small things, you know, maybe cut out all the processed food or reduce your sugar intake because all of these things significantly impact the mind. And a few other things that I didn't mention are gratitude. I mean, I always say you can't be grateful and hateful at the same time. So if you sit down and you truly reflect on what you're grateful for, it's difficult because we tend to forget, you know, we think we folk, we're, we live in a society where we focus on what we don't have versus what we do have. And we're all guilty of it. I am. I'm sure Dr. Kenodi is Lauren. I'm sure. I'm I'm not, here. I'm not. Oh, oh, he's, he's perfect. So he is not, but <laughs> we, all, we all forget what a beautiful life. If we have, you know, running water and food and all these things, then, then we're in a very blessed portion of the world. So of the population. So gratitude is a major game changer. And also it's backed by studies that it can not only improve your mood in the short term, but consistent gratitude practice can work over the long term.
I have another one, but I'll wait until then. No, that's great. And I like that you just broke it down too, because I know one of the first things I just thought of even with our patients is, you know, that's a, there's a lot of things out there. Where do I begin? Where do I start? And that can feel really overwhelming to people just not knowing how to make that, make it a habit, right? And just picking one thing versus feeling like you have to now do 10 things into your day and then it's not realistic. And I'm so happy that you bring up nutrition and diet because people don't always think of that as a quote unquote biohack but it's something that we make choices around every single day. And we know how important food is um, for many reasons, um, but just nourishing the body and mind. So you touched on so many great points in, in regards to, you know, different foods that can be supportive. And even if people are struggling with where to start looking at, you know, what, what food choice can I make today that's going to be supportive of my mental and brain health? And then you had one more thing there too, Kayla, that you were going to mention. I was hoping this would be over, but um, um, meditation. So meditation is a major biohack, in my opinion. I mean, the study of meditators versus non-meditators, the meditators all have more gray matter. The cortical thickness of their hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory, is actually thicker in meditators versus non-meditators. And the size of the amygdala, which is our fear center and our stress center, actually can decrease. So meditation, I think a lot of people struggle, including myself when I started, because you feel like you're doing it wrong. Um, we are human beings. We will always have thoughts come up and we can definitely improve just by sticking with the practice. And no, it doesn't matter if you've been doing it for five years or like I have, or even more, you're still going to have thoughts come up because we're human beings. I do have a little device that I like. It's called the Focus Calm. It's an at-home neurofeedback device, and it actually measures your brain waves. And why that's helpful is because I'm a very, um, I'm really into quantification, self-quantification, and I want to make sure what I'm doing is working and I'm spending my time in the most uh, efficient way. So I put on the headband and it measures the brainwave. So what it'll do, it'll tell you how many minutes you spent in focus calm. You want to have seven minutes per day. So when I first started, it would take me 30 minutes of meditation to be able to calm my brain for those seven minutes. Now I can get seven minutes in seven minutes. Because I've learned and it, and it feels so good. You know, my mood is instantly elevated. My focus is improved. So meditation is, is a major game changer for not only now, but the future. It's definitely, I would say, one of the most potent brain anti-aging hacks because we want to keep as much of that gray matter um, as possible because we do know that as we age, obviously cognitive decline comes into play, but, you know, also gray matter, we start to lose volume in our brain. And if we can do these practices like meditation that is free um, and, you know, quite simple overall, I think that's that's a major, you know, that's a major uh, boost for our brains. And I definitely encourage everyone to do that. Um, I want to touch upon one point, Lauren, about the meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I totally agree with her and, you know, um, about meditation. And I would say is probably the number one hack or thing I've done for my life. I, I really have. And um, um, in the past, I would say even 10 years, 20 years. Um, and um, one thing interesting about meditation that I just learned a few years ago was that when people are meditating five, 10 minutes, or even 20 minutes, the impacts are not the same they find that the brain actually changes at minute 44. So really, if people want badass results, never in my life did I meditate an hour in a row, so about a year ago. I've never seen anything as powerful in my life as getting that meditation for an hour together. So the people who know about the DNRS systems uh, DNRS or the limbic system, we tell people to do an hour at the same time, not 15 minutes, four times a day if they can. So I want to just throw that in there. If you're doing five, 10 minutes, that's awesome. But if you want amazing, amazing results, get that one hour in a row. And Lauren, you did the same program I did. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm talking about one program called the 45 Days to Awakening and then the Finders course, which I don't think is around anymore. Uh, but um, but yeah, I just want to add that one point to what Kayla said. 
Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I know both of us, when we talked about that, doing that program, I mean, it's, it's a commitment, right? Doing the, getting the at least 44, 45 minutes in a day, but um, huge benefits. And, you know, it's great to start somewhere, you know, the five, 10 minutes and working your way up to a goal. Um, so those are both really good points. Along the now I have to ask, are there any um, biohacks out there that are just really exciting that you haven't talked about today that you've seen recently? I know you've been talking to some big names and anything that's got you really excited right now, Kayla, um, that we should look out for. So a few things, definitely. Um, Neurofeedback is amazing. I think that neurofeedback can be really power, a really powerful tool. They are coming out with some at-home devices, but it can also be done in clinic. I think that there is some really interesting, and I hope I'm allowed to say this, but um, I think that there's some interesting trials with psychedelics going on, actually, um, with neuroplasticity, always with a clinician that really knows what they're doing with a provider. Um, in a medical setting. So I'm not at all encouraging anyone to do this at home, but I think that the research that's starting to come out and what the future could hold uh, with psychedelics is very interesting. Um, and then also at home, um, essentially like magnetic waves or pulsed electromagnetic field for the brain at home or in office. So these are all things that I would say are a couple of years out, but I think are really interesting because we know that depression is the number one disability in the world. And we have to, in my opinion, it's, it's one of the biggest problems that we're dealing with right now in society as a whole. And obviously there's a lot of layers and we won't go into how we got there, but between food and, and what's happened, you know, as of late and social media, there's all these reasons. But I think the next step is to figure out how do I get, we get ourselves out of this and back to a happier mindset because it's just absolutely crucial. So here's some interesting things. I also do um, photobiomodulation for the brain at home. So there's a device that I have called a V-Light. So it's actually a red light. And that's, again, boosting mitochondrial production and um, or mitochondrial energy. And with all of these things, you want to definitely do your research, make sure it's something that would make any sense for you at all, um, and be really cautious. You know, I try all sorts of things because I'm confident doing that, and I like to do that. But um, those are a couple of interesting things I see coming down the pipeline. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Kenodia? The biggest, you know, biohacks, you know, I have seen, one is like, I like the, the via lights, the nose ones, and um, the other ones that I like is, uh, there's biohacks that put the brain into a meditative state. And that's gonna be revolutionary because most people will not meditate an hour a day consecutively at time. Um, and so there's no, so if we can get that easy button. So there's a few devices out there, um, even one from Via Light um, called Neuro Pro that's had some great research. Um, I've not used that one myself yet. I'm looking, I'm looking at another device. And I'm also looking at another device um, next, next week or the week after. But I think things that can put the brain and the body into contentment. Everything that Kayla's saying, I'm saying, Lauren's saying is, uh, I'll tell you my, my biggest biohack, very simple, is how do you feel in this one second? You have a choice. We all do. Do we feel joyous, happy, anything other than that? If someone tries to say, I want to feel happy for an hour, that's really hard to do. Five minutes, that's hard to do. But for one second, can you choose gratefulness over anything else? Contentment, no matter what's going on. Kayla, you're a great sport. You're in an airport, you got such less sleep, you know, all their stuff, right? You have a choice. In this one second, how do you how do you want to be? You know. Um, this is a security advisor. Add 
One more other biohack, again, not, not technology wise, but um, is a lot of people, including myself, you know, when they feel emotions, the mind part, they try to distract it. Change your eating, Warren, or this or this, alcohol, tobacco, whatever it is, or, you know, something. One of the biggest biohacks I've seen is to say, feel the feelings. Do not try to not be angry, not be sad, whatever, feel it. Once you feel it, it usually goes away in 60 seconds to 90 seconds. And lean into it. And then it goes away, you get your life back. That's awesome. Because you're trying to distract yourself, the TV show with a book or something else like that, and then, it, then you haven't resolved it. a really good point. No, I like that. Those were great biohacks, great tools that can be implemented on the day to day, right? Something that feels doable, feels realistic, um, putting it into simple terms. Well, looking at um, our time here. So in terms of, you know, touching a little bit on the nutrition end, I know Kayla, you had already talked a little bit about diet and the importance of, you know, just making sure that we're being supportive of brain and mental health with what we're putting into our bodies. And, you know, from a dietitian standpoint, my passion for food is medicine, right? It's so true. You are what you eat. And we know that food is, is information. And so that is information for, um, how we live, our quality of our life. And you had mentioned the sardines, which cracked me up because I talk to patients all the time about sardines and the face that they give me <laughs> when I say sardines. I said, no, 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 we're going to find it into your diet. So and it tastes amazing, to be honest. I eat it all the time because yeah, I like it. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's just committing to buying them and doing it. But, you know, I look at it as, you know, started eating those as a supplemental source, right, of omega-3s. So it's not that I would just say, oh, I'm going to eat these. It's, well, look at it as food is medicine, something that you can do so you don't necessarily need to take a medication or this or just another step that can help support your body. So those high quality proteins, those healthy fats, so supportive of our mitochondria, which you touched on a little bit and our neurotransmitters. And I know we at MD talk a lot about, you know, different companies that um, you can buy quality meat from. And if you don't have it locally available to you, so there's always a resource out there and the other thing, you know, that I think we don't talk about as much is those oils and the oils that are in those packaged products and just how inflammatory they are. And, you know, when you pick up a, a, a product and you can't read any of the ingredients on the back, and I love that exercise where you have somebody read it and you say, well, what is this, right? What is this product? And if, if you don't know what it is, you know, that's, that's telling you something right there, or if you can't pronounce the ingredients or there's a whole laundry list. But a lot of them do have those cheap inflammatory oils um, within those products. So even by swapping out what you cook in at, cook with at home, um, doing more cooking at home and less of the processed products that are going to also uh, impact blood sugar balance imbalances and um, you know really just switching the conversation. So um, the last thing too there was the the antioxidant rich foods, right? So we want to protect our brain and, and prevent that oxidative stress that occurs to those brain cells. And so the more that we can, I know it's out there all the time, but eat the rainbow, eat the rainbow, eat the rainbow. So getting all those colors in and really making that a goal, right? There's a biohack right there in your day of eating. Are you eating all the different colors and making sure to incorporate those into your, your daily uh, plates that you're consuming. So, you know, just a couple things just wanted to touch on and Definitely for some mood boosting meals, you know, I always think about what, what do I do? You know, how can I practice what I preach to, to our clients and our patients and um, finding simple ways to just add the, the color to your eggs in the morning or add that salmon to a salad in the afternoon. Or I think you mentioned, Kayla, that you love walnuts, um, and wild blueberries, you know, quick, easy snacks and, and little additions that we can make. And if people struggle with that, you know, Dr. Kenodia, I know we've talked about the power of cooking at home and the importance of, of cooking. And that's why we created the teaching kitchen, you know, to, in order to offer that service and um, get people feeling comfortable in the kitchen to be able to um, not only support yourself, 
empower empower you, but also your family. So just a couple quick things there nutritionally. Um, and if you guys have anything else to add on that end with diet and nutrition, love to hear it. Oh, can't hear you. 100% yes on the oil. So soybean oil has been linked to genetic changes in the brain. Soybean oil is the most popular oil used in restaurants and packaged goods. Canola is right after it. And even places that you might think are really healthy, um, I guess I'll just say it, but Whole Foods, um, there's a lot of canola oil in their hot bar. And to me, it's upsetting, actually, but that's a different story. Um, but just be really aware of these things because these oils can be pro-inflammatory. They can be really oxidized, and they don't benefit your health. So that's why I really focus on the oils because the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio for Americans, I believe it's like 16 to 1. And I could be wrong, and please, Dr. Kenodia or uh, Lauren, can I correct me if I'm wrong? But so omega-6, if we look at that as, we'll just say, a not good fat lipid and versus omega-3s, we want that to be more in balance, not have this extreme level of omega-6s from these oils, for the most part, in processed goods, and then not be getting any the anti-inflammatory omega-3s. So just something to consider there. And then also dark chocolate, which people should be really happy about this because it tastes amazing, but dark chocolate is a great snack. I have like one to two pieces a day. I call it my mood booster, but uh, dark cacao, so dark chocolate, 70% cacao or higher mm -hmm. is really and incredible for brain health as well. And blueberries are one of my all-time favorites and a super brain food. So. <laughs> So I'm going to add one thing about food um, is that most, oh, probably two things. Um, one is about um, cravings and not being able to stick to any food plan you like. Sometimes it's because of there's low neurotransmitters or your fatigue, other things like that. So there's questionnaires you know, whether the mood, mood cure or crave cure that we use in our office, that can figure out if you're low on some neurotransmitters, if you take a supplement, it makes it easier to have the salmon or easier to have these other things. You know, I think that's number one. And uh, uh, that's been amazing for us to, so people don't feel judged. Why can't I eat a certain way? It's because sometimes your neurotransmitters are, are not balanced. I think number two, and, 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 I, and I did learn this from Mark Hyman, which was about sugar and the brain, right? The easiest way to get off sugar is having zero. That when we try to have just a little bit of sugar, it causes the cravings. And it's hard to get off that rat wheel. Study after study shows you give animals a choice of sugar water or heroin water. They go after sugar water every time. It's that addicting. And we know that sugar affects both the mind and the body. Every single illness and how we feel is affected by sugar. Two really great points. And actually, as we head into this Q&A session, um, one of the first question here, um, I think goes nicely with what you just said, Dr. Kenodia, but the question that somebody posed was, I notice I feel depressed after a heavier meal like pizza. I really enjoy occasional junk meals and don't want to give them up, but I realize it might not be the best for my mood. How can I still enjoy meals I love while not dragging down my mood? I, I can, uh, can I give a little bit of feedback on that? Please. Yeah. So I would say a few things. I, I would say, first of all, you might want to consider re reframing about foods that you love because you want to love foods that also love you back. So maybe you've told yourself that you love pizza, but if it makes you feel not so well, do you really love it is really the question. That, that would be my first point is kind of reframing because I think we live in a society where we think that maybe alcohol or pizza are treats and we get them, you know, for deserving it or something of that nature. But um, your taste buds, if you cut that out, they will change and they will develop to actually crave like, for example, I, I don't crave many things that I don't already eat. Like I crave wild blueberries because I think that they're the best tasting food. Um, I'll actually share with you guys the worst thing that I crave and it's dates. 
and I know that they're very high in sugar, but they're also very good. Um, so that would be that would be part one, and then part two is you still can enjoy foods, of course. It's just um, I would try to maybe, of course, make sure there's no gluten because that could be a sensitivity that you have. Maybe make it at home. Um, it could be a fun like experience too, um, and then just do it in smaller quantities. I would go on a little bit more, but this noise. So sorry. No, I agree with you, Kayla. Those were some of my initial thoughts too, where it was like reframing, you know, also that any adjustments or tweaks that you make right now may not need to be forever. So let's try to explore, you know, well, what if we try a gluten-free option or making this at home, like a cauliflower pizza crust and making it a thing with your family? Um, you know, explore why, why are you not feeling good? Is it your digestion? You know, what, what is exactly is the disconnect there? And then how can we get to the root of that? But the whole reframing piece, I think, is so important. And then, like you said, you start to create your taste buds change for what you're eating and what you're putting more of into your body. So I don't think it's that, you know, you can't eat pizza. It's just we need to make some tweaks and figure out why this is occurring. Did you have anything else to add, Dr. Knodi, on that? I do. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, and so the reason why we're tired after eating that stuff is one could be definitely the foods. Other is your GI tract. That your stomach, small intestine, large intestine may not be healthy. Whether so, there's, there's advanced testings you can do, and there's supplements you can do, but we need to figure out what is the cause. Mm -hmm. You should not feel tired after eating. That's not the goal of food. And there is a solvable reason for it. Yes, there is. Well, let's go on to the second question here. Had, what are some practical things you can advocate for in your workplace to decrease stress and improve mental health for employees? Well, I have a couple of great office biohacks. This is more about setting the stage to actually improve the environment. So one is lighting, and I understand that not everyone will be able to change their lighting. But if you have your own office, consider um, circadian lighting. It's going to give you more energy throughout the day versus what you could call junk light. Plants in the office are great for not only boosting the environment and focus and productivity. There's some studies to show that, but also to purify the air. Um, I would definitely say, suggest an air purifier because we want to keep our homes. And I didn't touch base on this, but... We want to keep our homes as low toxin as possible. So the water that we're drinking, definitely important to have filtered water. Um, I do RO and then I remineralize it. And I know that Dr. Kenodi is very passionate about water. Um, and so it's setting the tone in the actual environment, maybe a standing desk so that you can, you know, break away and walk um, is an important one. And then, of course, you know, things for more of like an emotional aspect of boundaries and, you know, setting boundaries within your, within uh, coworkers, bosses, things of that nature. But those are some of my top kind of biohacks for the office. Ergonomic keyboard. Just set yourself up so you're really comfortable and you enjoy your space. Um, similar to the airport that I'm in right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yes, those would be my, like, office biohacks is trying to keep the toxins as low as possible because that, that um, wears on us over time. And it decreases our energy levels, get some sunlight in the day. How about you, Dr. Kennedy? Anything you'd like to add? I think that it would be interesting to see for that person, what is the stressor? Is it a boss? Is it a coworker? Is it the amount of hours? The time of day, right? I think there's different reasons for someone being stressed in the office. Mm -hmm. or stressed in life. And while say is, is the big picture that, and this is gonna sound blasphemy, I know it, um, that no one can cause you stress. You control how you feel in general. There's exception to the rule, but if we let something external stress us, the environment is affecting us and we're never ever gonna be happy or content. If we realize that we are actually in control of how we feel, then we might have the worst boss ever, whatever. Uh, and Lauren, don't tell me I'm the worst boss ever. Uh, <laughs> the same yeah. my boss on this call. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and uh, but, um, you know, 
it's an empowering thought that you can control how you feel versus being a victim, you know, and some things are controllable, some things aren't. Um, I think one thing actionable people can do, they call it the locus of control. Stress is when you're not in control. So if you want to have less stress in work, figure out what things can you control, what things can't you control. If there's certain things you can't control, the better to not think about it. What can I control in my workspace that I can do and I feel comfortable in that relaxes people? I have one more point. It might be a little bit left field, um, but just to kind of open up the thought around this. I also think it's so important to have your career be aligned with your purpose and your passion in life. Because we spend more time in our career than we do with our families for the most part. And so if you think back to when you were a child, what made you most happy? What did you want to do when you were a child? Does what you do now align with what you want to be doing? And I understand that, yes, it's a bit over, you know, left field. And I'm not recommending that you immediately change careers or anything. But consider, does what you do bring only stress to your life? Or does it also bring joy? Because life is so short. And of course, we want to extend it. And we're all working on that in the longevity sector. And we hope 180 is like our 50th birthday in the near future. But um, for now, it's so important to do things that you love. Because right now we get one shot at this. And I think that if you love what you do, you'll also have less stress. Awesome. So yeah, Lauren, I say let's, I think let's, let's end for today. So I'll, I'll let you close. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you both. This was an amazing talk. I think everybody got a lot of value out of this. I can't wait to watch it all over again so I can hear all the biohacks yet a second time. And um, yeah, thank you both Dr. Kenodia and Kayla for a wonderful discussion. And we appreciate everybody being here with us today. Um, look out for our next webinar. Take care. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Likewise, Lauren, thank you for moderating and, and giving us great information. Of course. And likewise, Kayla, thank you for making the time inside of an airport. Anytime. I see, I love what I do. So it, for me, it's not even work and I'm happy to do it. So. Yeah. And so thank you everyone. Bye.